and see us. Um, well, welcome to this all party parliamentary group for health and homes, healthy homes and buildings uh, meeting. I, I get the job of chairing you today because I'm president of the Sustainable Energy Association, which campaigns on these, these self same issues. And I chair the other all party parliamentary group, the one on uh, housing and care for older people, uh, which has a big uh, overlay with, with, with this one. So we've got a a star-studded cast of uh, speakers and plenty of time for a discussion as well. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Stephen Holgate to start us off. Just before he does, we've got a, a slide that gives us a bit of background information on why housing is a health issue and health is a housing issue indeed. Uh, some of the of the key statistics. Just have a quick a quick look at those. I'd just add that. Uh, with the, with the COVID story all around us, uh, it has brought home the relationship between housing and health. It is people in overcrowded conditions. It is people in very unsatisfactory uh, uh, home circumstances who have been contracting the dreaded virus. And these are the same people, I'm afraid, who, when we get to the winter, uh, will be faced with cold and damp and whose problems are going to be much worse then than they are today. Housing uh, impacting uh, on health and health uh, impacting on, on, on housing. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to launch off with you, Stephen. Stephen uh, Holgate uh, from the University of Southampton to give us a, a really significant overview of where we stand on these issues, please. Yes, thank you, Lord Best, and thank you for actually drawing attention to the COVID issue. Um, you probably recall I've just um, presented a, a paper to the uh, SAGE committee that's attracted quite a lot of attention about what the winter is going to look like uh, in terms of another um, resurgence of COVID. So uh, mm. the indoor environment very much featured in that report that's uh, obviously got quite a lot of publicity. So yes. you're absolutely spot on. Uh, the, a light is being shined um, shone on this area and uh, I think it's very timely we're having this meeting where health and the health of the nation is so dependent upon the domiciles uh, and the places we work and, and under educated. My colleague Dr. Bryony Turner is going to give uh, an overview. She's um, very kindly uh, helped uh, us resurrect uh, a working party that we uh, had over the last two years uh, which was supported by the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health and the Royal College of Physicians. And the reason we had this working party um, to establish it was the increasing evidence base that the indoor environment was affecting the health of the nation, but in particular the health of young people and children, and that we needed to really try and get some action on this because it seemed to be seemed to be an area which had slipped through a lot of the regulatory cracks uh, compared to, for example, outdoor air pollution. And, uh, and things were happening at a pace, uh, as we'll no doubt talk about at this, uh, in this uh, all-party uh, parliamentary group today, about the new build and what's happening out there in terms of, of construction. So, Bryony, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and, uh, and put your slides up? Hi there. Hi, I'm Bryony Turner. I'm Secretariat for the Indoor Air Quality Working Party, um, which uh, Professor Stephen Holgate is co-chair of. Um, we're hosted by the University of Reading, having previously been hosted by the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and I'll, I'll go through a bit more detail. Um, next slide, please. So, um, the Indoor Air Quality Working Party, um, our mission is to advance public understanding, the quality of access and experience of healthier indoor air for children and other vulnerable groups in the wider population. Um, and we, we do this in a number of ways, and I'm going to, to talk you through very quickly the work that we've been doing um, on indoor air quality and child health in homes and schools. We synthesize and make recognitions from research um, of indoor air quality and its health effects. 
Um, and we try and, and our next stage of work is really giving this robust evidence, a bit of a narrative, a story and a relevance to everyday life, to the general public, as well as to committees like this that can affect the change that we are making recommendations about. And um, we seek to, you know, ultimately inform and educate everyone in a position to take action for healthcare indoor air. Um, so who are we? Um, well, um, we're a group of, uh, you know, I'd actually say some of the world leading scientists um, working on the built environment um, and, and health. Um, as you've just heard from the introduction from Professor Stephen Holgate, who's um, co-chair alongside with Jonathan Grigg, um, we have this very active working party. We worked for the past sort of, I'd say, about a year and a half um, to review the evidence, and that included a systematic review, um, and then to pull together um, the evidence of, of what the health effects were that children were experiencing in homes and schools that there was robust evidence for, and then what pollutants were causing those health effects. So we worked from the health backwards, um, and health is very much a, a housing and a building story as we found. We published in January uh, this year our report findings, and we tried to make sure they were in as sort of accessible English as possible, um, but it's a huge, um, a huge evidence base and actually quite a, a large document. And we're now working on distilling these messages. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so just to sort of really reinforce the point around the indoor environment shaping human health. Um, you know, we, we actually looked at children and, and said that, you know, the health effects um, for children affect them throughout the life course, not just their exposure as children. Um, uh, and immediate effects um, and affect us all. Um, so we actually looked right from uh, birth and infancy and even um, pregnancy as well um, through to school age in this particular uh, report. And we just wanted to also highlight that um, it's not just the building structure and the fittings and fixtures and um, uh, chemical pollutants but also biological pollutants we're all well aware um, and also um, things that go hand in hand with pollution like acoustics um, that also cause um, stress and physiological and, and psychological impacts health effects. You can go to the next slide please. Um, so I think this working party having attended a number of your meetings is actually quite well versed in um, a number of the sort of key pollutants in, in our buildings. Um, uh, so I'll be sort of skating through all of this, but uh, uh, our report does actually detail um, the types of uh, pollutants that do lead to health effects and the types of um, rooms um, in homes and schools that um, include them. But just um, on the left, you'll see that there's um, some examples of sources right from sort of insulation to um, carpets and, and paints and, and wooden floors. And that's why it's important that we're not just looking at building regulations, but we're also looking at things like uh, labeling schemes um, for um, decoration, um, home decoration materials and furnishing products. And the whole things go sort of hand in hand in our, in our buildings. Um, we can't just look at the structure, but it's incredibly important to do so. Next slide, please. So why this matters, um, we're spending more and more of our lives indoors and that is very, very uh, evident to everyone during a, a period of lockdown, even with some restrictions eased and there will still be people shielding um, and by no means are clear uh, and could face uh, further lockdowns. Um, so these sort of findings, which we had already take on an even greater significance. Um, and children, even before lockdown, were spending a greater proportion of their lives indoors than outdoors. And you think of the significance and the care and attention and the um, science effort that has gone into understanding outdoor air quality. And yet our indoor environment and many parts of it still remain um, sort of a mystery actually in terms of what's going on in terms of cocktails of pollutants and, and the longer term health effects. Um, and, and to point out that the air inside our homes can be five times more polluted than the air outside. Um, children's bedrooms are often the most polluted um, and of course children's lungs are, are most susceptible to the harmful effects from damp, mould and airborne toxins. Um, 
so before we kind of go into our recommendations, um, it's really important to actually think about children and young people who are having their life courses um, and their adulthood actually affected right now by, by what they're being exposed to. And they really want us to take action, not just to have meetings like this, but for all groups like the APPG to, to actually really bring about change, change in action um, through government and, and through, through the professionals that are parts of those groups. And, and they really want to make sure that there is clear, factual and accessible information out there. I know the APPG has discussed that a lot, but also we need to link up with GPs and, and health professionals and provide them with the information that we know as the built environment community um, to, to help them when they are guiding particularly uh, physiologically vulnerable um, children and other groups as to um, what can be done about their home environments to perhaps ease some of the um, some of the health effects they have. Next, next slide please. Um, so our recommendations um, are set up along several themes um, which you can see down the left hand side and, and they really are quite a number of synergies with the um, APPG's white paper. I think where we particularly agree is that there needs to be a cross government committee to coordinate working in health environment education and homes um, for uh, better indoor air quality uh, and particularly now that, that we, we have this um, uh, pandemic on our hands. Um, we also need to set emission standards and labelling systems for building materials, furniture, home decoration and products um, based on any health hazards. And, and we need regulations to take a precautionary approach to restrict the use of chemicals which have not been tested for their potential health effects. And finally, in terms of our recommendations to government, there were many, many other recommendations, but we do believe that there need to be quality standards for um, home air quality monitors, air filtration and air cleaning devices to protect consumers from ineffective devices and ensure that they do not reintroduce pollutants. So in the second half of the presentation, having given you a bit of an outline, I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to, to look at our report. Um, we, we sort of started thinking a bit more in terms of um, the global pandemic and, and what that highlights. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to hand over to um, Stephen um, to just the points he to reinforce in, in terms of the health and well-being aspects of um, the built environment on these three areas. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, these are the points, of course, that have been very much in the press recently uh, with the COVID de debate going on, um, because obviously um, ventilation, humidity and heating has a lot to do not only with the indoor air pollutants, chemical ones, but also the biological ones that Brian here referred to. And of course, COVID uh, is, uh, is one of those biological pollutants that we don't often think of in terms of pollution. But viruses, of course, are suspended in the air and there's an active debate at the moment as to whether air pollution itself can accelerate uh, the infection process for COVID-19, let alone making the disease worse. Next slide, please. Thank you. Well, Inequality brings with it, of course, overcrowding, and there's been a lot of debate about that in recent times, especially the um, black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups, where a lot of the uh, problems of overcrowding and multiple generations of families living together is causing difficulties. And this is going to be the case for chemical air pollution, just as it is uh, in the case of COVID-19. Then we have a, a tremendous problem, which is just quietly creeping up uh, without anybody really drawing enough attention to it, though I'm sure this all party parliamentary group has, namely the reuse of buildings, in particular um, warehouses and office buildings that are being converted into living accommodation, which is often completely inadequate in terms of the families that are living there. And often these places are in, um, uh, building estates, uh, industrial estates, and in totally inappropriate uh, uh, sites. And that's an issue we're really very concerned about. And I've mentioned uh, the, uh, the uh, black, Asian, and minority ethnic community, which are a community particularly at risk, I think, from air pollution because of uh, their lifestyle, but also their, that they have increased uh, health problems, particularly cardiovascular and, uh, and metabolic problems, which increase their susceptibility to the effects of air pollution, let alone 
uh, these virus infections. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what we really want now is to really think about getting the quality of research in place that has informed outdoor air pollution regulatory um, decision making, because there's no doubt that the quality of air pollution research has driven the science to cause, uh, I think, um, policy changes, which we're witnessing now uh, in the outdoor air and the debate on the PM 2.5 as the new WHO standard, which is hopefully going to be uh, brought in uh, on the environment bill. But we haven't got any information really of that quality for the indoor air. So we found this out when we were researching um, the literature and we found out that many of the studies are really quite small, poorly controlled, and actually not really conducted to the sort of standard we would expect if a proper scientific decision-making machine was going to use that information for policy development. So we need better health-related research. Secondly, we need to understand which of the exposures are the most uh, dangerous to different populations. And we were talking about children in our report, but of course you have other people uh, such as those with asthma and allergies or older people who are more susceptible uh, to the chemicals that accumulate inside buildings. And then the third area which we want to bring attention to, which actually is now beginning to gain some energy is the school and the school place because often school buildings are poorly ventilated and there hasn't been enough attention to the quality of air that children breathe in those environments where of course they spend a lot of their time. We didn't deal with workplaces in our report but that's not to say they're not important but the health and safety executive uh, has of course got regulations in workplaces which do at least uh, control some of the uh, exposures such as uh, asbestos and, and, and uh, volatile chemicals. I'm going to have to speed you up a bit, Stephen, as we're running out of time. Okay, well, we're near, at the end now. Can you have the next slide, please? Sorry. Thank you very much. So really, our call to you all is to avoid, is to try and get the all-party parliamentary group to help us, really, in our endeavour to activate stakeholders so that we avoid bringing pollution from outside indoors, that we set about trying to improve the uh, situation where sources of indoor pollution, uh, which have health effects, are controlled properly. And we need to think about the mitigation strategies of our buildings to reduce exposure. And for all of this, we need better high quality research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. That, that was fascinating. And, and you're right in, in presupposing that in the housing world, we don't think enough about indoor pollution. We really don't. We probably do think quite a lot about those permitted development rights that have converted uh, very unsuitable warehouses and offices into ghastly little, little tiny, sometimes even windowless flats. Yeah. Yeah. But indoor air pollution, wow, we've really got to get our heads around this. Can, can we move on with, with many, many thanks to Brian and to, to Stephen, yes, to you. Rachel Toms from Public Health England, and then Sarah Roxby, if you could follow one after the other, Sarah from the Wakefield and District Council, where she does both health and housing together. Starting with you though, Rachel, uh, program manager for the Healthy Places Initiative, which is really important. Please give us your perspective. Thank you. So I'm going to talk really briefly about the evidence on housing and health in terms of individual dwellings. And given the time slot, I'm not going to talk about other types of building or neighbourhood design in this instance. Um, so just very briefly in terms of Public Health England's role. So our mission is to um, protect and improve the nation's health and to address inequalities. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that issue of inequalities. So health inequalities are avoidable and unfair differences in the health status between different groups of people. Um, and as I think everyone knows, there's a very strong correlation between deprivation and health outcomes and health inequalities. Um, and we use two key measures of health inequalities, life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Um, and with life expectancy, the gap in life expectancy between people in different circumstances and different areas is sadly widening um, in England at the moment. 
um, including pre-COVID. And in terms of years lived in good health, the gap is even bigger and it's growing more rapidly. So at the moment, the uh, well, pre-COVID, I should say, the gap um, in healthy life expectancy between people in the most and the least deprived parts of the country is 19 years for both men and women. And lots of different things contribute to your life expectancy and your healthy life expectancy. And one of those factors is your home environment. Um, so in essence, poor housing leads to avoidable health problems by causing or exacerbating ill health, physical or mental or both. And that ill health generates demand on the NHS, which we've already heard about um, and, and the, the, the cost of treating that preventable illness that the NHS is bearing. Um, so what are the preventable health issues that poor housing contributes to? Well we group these housing problems into unhealthy, unsuitable and unstable and I'll just share some headlines from each of those three different types of housing issue that has implications for health. Um, so an unhealthy home um, is one that might be too cold or too hot or poorly ventilated or damp or a home that contains other hazards. Um, and these types of issues can cause or exacerbate all sorts of illnesses, some of which we've heard about um, already. Respiratory illnesses, cardiovascular problems, mental health issues, physical injuries, particularly in children and older people. There are also associations with poor diet in children, poor infant weight gain, um, and associations with domestic fires and excess winter deaths. Um, and the greatest burden of housing related ill health is cold homes. Um, often people living in energy inefficient properties where they may be struggling to pay the fuel bill to stay warm. Um, so in 2017, for example, two and a half million households in England were living in fuel poverty. Um, the second bit greatest burden of poor housing on health is hazards that lead to falls in the home. Poor indoor air quality is also an issue which um, others have already touched on. Um, there's the effects of hot weather which can cause indoor overheating and that also leads to excess deaths. Um, and flooding is another risk to health that people can experience in their home. Um, so the second category that we look at is unsuitable homes. This is where people are living in overcrowded conditions or the home isn't accessible or it's not meeting other needs that the residents might have. So if um, a home isn't adapted so that a disabled person can use the bathroom properly, for example, or if in a particular area there's a lack of supported accommodation for people with dementia or a lack of specialist housing for people with learning disabilities and, and those uh, individuals are living in essentially unsuitable um, housing that has implications for their health. So in unsuitable homes we see um, higher rates of tuberculosis, respiratory illness, mental health problems, uh, a lot of negative impacts on children's development, education and behaviour um, and there's a, there's a series of other health issues. There's um, more detail on the evidence on this um, on the website um, and then thirdly an unstable home so this is precarious living circumstances or someone who's at a risk of becoming homeless homeless so a home that doesn't offer a sense of safety and security and again that's associated with um, a series of uh, physical and mental health problems um, in terms of who's affected, which we've also heard a bit about, um, anyone can be affected by housing related ill health, but some groups are more vulnerable. So children and their families, people with long term conditions or learning disabilities, people on low incomes, people already experiencing mental health issues um, and people who are older and people in lower socioeconomic groups and people living in more deprived areas are more likely to face these housing issues. So essentially housing uh, or poor housing is contributing both to preventable ill health and that burden on the NHS, but also it's a contributor to health inequalities and that growing gap between uh, the more privileged and those facing the biggest challenges in life. Um, just quickly on how healthier housing can be achieved for new homes it's about making sure that we don't 
build health risks into people's homes through their design or construction, um, primarily through building regulations. And for existing homes, it's about retrofit. Um, and um, going back to um, the, uh, the burden on the NHS to remedy the worst housing in England will cost about 10 billion pounds, which is doing things like improving heating, energy efficiency, undertaking repairs in existing homes. And that investment would pay for itself um, in terms of the treatment costs um, borne by the NHS in just under seven years and two months. Thank you. Sorry, you're on mute, Richard. Talking to myself. There we go. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, and uh, I was saying that uh, on that theme of fuel poverty, we have now got two billion, at any rate, of the 10 billion that you think will be needed altogether uh, to do a, a lot of insulation and energy efficiency measures in, in uh, private homes of different sorts. So a step has been taken by government in the right direction there. Long way to go. Can we, can we go on then, if we may, to Sarah Roxby from, from Wakefield. Sarah, please. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I think I have some slides, if um, they could be put up on the screen. I don't know if you can see them. Just whilst they're loading up, I'll just introduce myself. I'm um, Sarah Roxby. I'm the Service Director for Health and Wellbeing at Wakefield District Housing. We're a stock transfer um, registered social landlord with approximately 33,000 properties in Wakefield. So we house a third of the Wakefield population. But I'm also the strategic housing and health lead for the West Yorkshire and Harrogate integrated care system. So it's, as part of this presentation, I'm just going to outline to you how housing integrates into the health and social care system at an integrated care system level. I'll talk through how that translates then in terms of local place like Wakefield and then share a couple of examples of our partnerships in practice. So just to begin with, the slide that you can see um, just intends to show the correlation between housing and health. So where you live, as we've heard, greatly impacts on, on your health and a good home is essential to good health. So the basics need to be right for somebody and those basics are, is a warm, affordable home, somewhere that's safe and secure and accessible and supportive. And if we've got those basics right, then the theory is that people will be able to protect their well-being, their mental health, they'll be able to self-care at home and they'll be able to stay at home for longer. And that will impact and delay on the, the need for people to go into hospital and to receive social care and primary care services. But we know that the basics are not right for everybody. So if, as we've heard, um, poor housing costs, it costs the NHS. And we do know that uh, fuel poverty is a, is a major issue. We've still got 2.4 million households living in fuel poverty. We also know that people who are struggling with housing costs it will significantly impact on their mental health. And we also know that homeless people um, are a resource drain on the health service unnecessarily, and they'll use the health service eight times more than anybody in the general population. Let's just move on to the next slide, please. So just to give a bit of a background of our health and care landscape across West Yorkshire and Harrogate, um, it, it, you know, the ICS recognises that housing is an integral part to improving the overall health and care system. It's the fourth largest ICS in the country. Uh, there's a population of 2.2 million and a budget of 5.5 billion. It's a really complex landscape. We've got several CCGs, councils, hospital trusts, thousands of voluntary and community sector organisations. We've also got 60 RSL, uh, registered social landlords and they provide over 110,000 properties across the patch. Next slide, please. So the partnership has a number of priorities and the housing and health programme is aligned to the Improving Population Health programme. That's all about preventing ill health, addressing health inequalities and also looking at how we can improve the wider determinants of health of which, of course, housing is clearly one of those. Next slide, please. How that translates into a local level um, is for the, the slide shows Wakefield is that we've got the West Yorkshire and Harrogate partnership. Each place has a health and wellbeing board that's linked into the overall integrated care system. 
and each place has an integrated care partnership. So in Wakefield, house, housing and health is seen as a key enabler to improving a number of priority work streams for our local place, and they're around end of life care, mental health, elderly care and prevention. So we have a clear remit, we've got a clear programme and we've got a clear reporting structure. So that was just a bit of a background in terms of our governance. So I'll move on to how our partnerships work in practice. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of an independent living, sheltered housing scheme, extra care scheme. Um, not a great choice for somebody who's older, um, typical 60s, 70s build, not somewhere that I don't think any of us dialing into this call today would choose to live. But many registered social landlords like ourselves up and down the country have invested in these types of schemes and our programme to invest in those schemes, have, uh, we've put in over 50 million to improve schemes where people want to live. Next slide, please. So we've transformed existing accommodation and built new accommodation for older and vulnerable people, which will offer them safety and security, affordable warmth. We know from studies done by Demos that hospital stays for people who are 75 and older living in this type of accommodation can be reduced on average by 10 days, um, more so than somebody who's 75 living in general needs accommodation. But just to say, I suppose this type of accommodation does need some long term funding and um, sustainability options because because we've not got the funding options in place at the moment, that's reducing the growth of this type of accommodation. We do know that we've got an ageing population and a lot of them, particularly in the north, are living in poor standard accommodation that are owner occupied and they've not got the choices of other accommodation to move into. Um, next slide, please. So just keeping on the theme of this accommodation, uh, in 2015, uh, the NHS were successful in um, NHS in, in Wakefield, sorry, were successful in getting some Vanguard funding through from NHS England. So where we'd improved our buildings and put the investment into the, the um, brick, bricks and mortar, we wanted to make sure that people could live well within these buildings as well. And we became part of the National Care Home Vanguard. Um, the Care Home Vanguard was all around looking at how we could stop people in residential care going into hospital. But what we wanted to prove was that these schemes could stop people going into residential care in the first place. So we pushed and got an extra care scheme into the Vanguard and our focus was around social activities. So we'd improved the property, but we knew people were being isolated in their own flats because their care packages didn't allow them to have social interactions and they were becoming isolated. And if you become isolated, your physical health will deteriorate and your mental health will deteriorate. So we used our funding to increase social activities. We put on intergenerational activities and we brought in partners from the voluntary and community sector. Just to give you an idea of how that worked for us, our baseline at the start of the programme was that 34% of our tenancy terminations had been terminated for people going into residential care. In the first year of the Vanguard, where we'd improved activities, we looked at that, that stat again and it had reduced to 14% of tenancy terminations for residential care. NHS England awarded some more funding to us and in our third year we didn't have a single tenancy termination for somebody going into residential care. So that speaks volumes in terms of investing in a property but also investing in the people that are living in it. Next slide please. So as we've said we, we can invest in the properties but we've also got to look at who's living in those properties and as a housing officer by background day in day out our housing officers are still coming across properties and people that are living as you can see in the slides here people that have got drug and alcohol problems people that hoard and the middle flat there is somebody who set fire to the property for the mental health reasons we're trying to help people and support people who are living complex lives and we cannot do that alone it needs a joined up approach between housing health and social care to do that if we, can't, if we can't join up on that, we can't resolve some of these issues. So I'm going to give you some um, examples now of where we've joined up to address some of the issues that you're seeing here in these pictures. Next slide, please. We know that there's a strong link between poverty and mental health. 
We know that we have got some of our tenants that are choosing whether they heat their property or whether they feed their children. So as a housing association, we've got um, a responsibility to make sure that our tenants are supported financially and that their financial confidence can grow. We also help them find work and have employment advisors to help them get back onto that track. We've started a Healthy Wealthier Families project in Wakefield, which is a joint partnership between health and housing and referrals are coming in from health visitors um, supporting new parents um, to make sure that they are managing their finances and keeping a healthy home over their new family's head. Next slide please. Our focus is really on tenancy sustainment, making sure that people can live healthily in their homes and we also have teams of wellbeing and mental health nurses supporting our tenants and again these are partnerships between ourselves as a landlord and um, the NHS and also the, the mental health trust so we employ mental health navigators um, last year they were able to prevent tenancy enforcement action 25% of our enforcement cases so saving people from losing their homes due to antisocial behaviour they are a key part of housing management today they're a fundamental part of how we, we um, support our tenants next slide please Linked to that team, we've also got housing support and coordination in the hospitals. So we have housing coordinators, both in our acute hospital, hospital trust and our mental health hospital trust. So we know that when we go into hospital at the moment that our health needs are looked at. And it isn't until somebody's ready for discharge that their home environment is looked at. So having the housing support coordinators embedded in the hospitals enables us to get ahead of that and enables us to look at the patient's journey through hospital and remove barriers to them going home so that patients are not being discharged to the types of properties that you just saw earlier and that their plan their, their discharge home is being well planned well thought out and they're going back to an appropriate and suitable home so that was a bit of a whistle stop tour and um, there was a lot to say there just to, to i suppose end on my point um, if you could just click the slide again, there's a quote that comes up from Octavia Hill, our founder of social housing back in the 1800s. Um, you know, she had the foresight there. And I think this typifies our partnership ethos now is that health, housing, health and social care have to go hand in hand. If we want to achieve healthy homes, healthy places and healthy people, we've got to work together. Thank you. you're on silent sorry mute unmute who would think a year ago that the word that you'd hear most of every day of your life would be unmute <laughs> but that that's where we've got to apologies uh, i'm unmuted and and i was uh, thanking sarah very much for that lovely to see octavia hill at the end of it now we were going to welcome uh, christopher pincher uh, the housing minister to join us at this stage, but uh, it's an, an un, uh, it is a, a circumstance that I have actually encountered before. Ministers not coming at the last minute. Very sorry about that, but uh, that's the way it is. <laughs> yes, shadow ministers are a very different kettle of fish. We'll, we'll come to, to that just shortly, thank you. Um, but instead of the minister, we do have a, 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 an official from the the department from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Could that person identify themselves and just uh, say who they are and, and I can welcome them? Hi, it's me, Jenny Thomas. Jenny, thank you very much for joining us. So uh, a, a bit of wider discussion um, and, and questions from people who, who've already prepared something, hoping the minister would answer it, but perhaps, Jenny, you might be able to help with nonetheless. I think what I'm going to do is just to extend this a bit because um, Thangam Debonair, the uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Housing, and Thangam, we're really glad to have you with us. Uh, you've got to go relatively soon, so let me bring you in uh, from the beginning. And so we've got both Jenny and Thangam uh, able to uh, address some of the issues that we've got. Now, I think... Uh, Someone is going to tell me about questions that have already been prepared. Um, who's going to come up with a, with a question for me? Jill, are you on the case here? Emily? I 
I think it's me, Love Best. Right. Um, it's Jake Lucia yeah. from the Sustainable Yay, Energy Association. First. Great. I am. Um, thank Good you. Good to have you with us. Uh, yeah. I had a previous all-party parliamentary group for healthy homes and buildings. Um, that previous housing minister, Kit Malthouse, stated that he would be responsible for healthy homes and that that responsibility lay with himself. Um, we'd love to know, does the current housing minister agree with his predecessor's views and what actions he is planning to take to deliver healthy homes? It's the job of the minister. Healthy homes comes down to the minister in the, on the housing side. It is a housing response. And of course, it was the same minister for about 50 years. The minister for health was also minister for housing. Uh, the, the two ran together, but not anymore. But Jenny, in terms of that link, uh, any thoughts on, on how today we're managing to, to bridge the divide between health and housing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my role at the ministry is, is head of the design team and we lead on sort of design quality, which takes into account all aspects of the design of places and homes, which includes the impact that they have on people's health and well-being. Um, it's certainly been a focus of um, various pieces of work that the government have been doing recently, particularly in relation to building regulations where um, the parts E, F, G and H, which I've uh, noted as the ones which deal very much with well be places being well ventilated um, and suitability for water drainage and acoustic insulation to support their health and well-being. But beyond that, we've had the Future Home Standard Consultation, um, which contained quite a lot about the indoor air quality parameters um, that might underpin the ventilation requirements in new homes. And that consultation closed earlier this year, um, and the team are working hard at the moment to look through those responses, and that will be published in the near future. Um, in terms of other initiatives, there's the Home of 2030 competition, which was launched by the Housing Minister earlier this year. Um, and that's a competition to design and deliver high quality and affordable homes fit for the future, which are energy efficient and suitable for all generations to enable people to live that bit longer in their own homes and to really demonstrate there that environmental standards and healthy homes should go hand in hand and be part of the same single solution. And then finally, we also had the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission who reported um, earlier this year. They made reference to the importance of design in the broader sense, again, in terms of how beauty could improve the lives of people who were living there in terms of health and well-being, and also made reference to air quality within, within their report. Um, and again, we're in the process now of formulating the government's response, and we've, we've welcomed the recommendations, the 45 recommendations made by the Commission, um, and in the very near future, we'll be publishing the government's response to that and actions that we'll be taking. Many thanks, Jenny. There's the some reassurance there that when the Prime Minister tells us we're going to build, 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 this isn't just about the numbers, it's about the quality as well. It's not just quantity, a really important thing. And would you like to come in at this point? I will, and uh, I quite agree that it's important that we are going to build, build, build. But in the words of Lord Deben, who yesterday was on another Zoom I was on, um, about uh, making sure that homes could be um, properly heated and we're going to work towards net carbon, net zero carbon emissions. He used a, um, a, a, a different word to the one I'm going to use, but he said, don't build rubbish homes. The word rubbish was the one that was slightly different. And, and he's right. And I think that we need to recognise that we, we, we haven't got time to come up with too many pilots or investigations. We've got a lot of expert people, some of whom are on this call, who already know how to make sure that homes are affordable to heat. Because homes that people can't afford to heat are not healthy. Homes that are leaking heat out of them because they're not properly insulated are not healthy. Homes that haven't addressed true affordability, because affordable has become a word that I think has been very misused and is no longer linked to what people can actually afford, but to some market definition, which has really, really excluded an awful lot of people from being able to buy or rent a home that is truly affordable. And I'm concerned, and it is a concern, and I certainly don't expect Jenny to answer this. I am concerned when the government talks about planning regulations being the problem. And when the prime minister announced all the bill, bill, bill stuff a couple of weeks ago, he seemed to be identifying planning regulations as a problem. I'm not saying planning is a perfect process. It certainly isn't. But one of the ways in which we make sure that homes are not 
that word that Lord Eben used yesterday, I'm going to say the word rubbish, um, that they are well insulated, that they are energy efficient and therefore healthy and they are truly affordable. The way we do that is through regulation. And if you have a planning system being bypassed, then we don't have the levers in the democratically elected representatives of our local communities. Um, we don't, they don't, they're not in their hands to be able to make sure that build, builders are not developing or retrofitting rubbish homes. And that really matters. So that's something the government's intentions may be that every home is going to be healthy. And I hope that's true. But in order to make sure that happens and that homes are really being built according to the local needs of local people, we do need to make sure that there is still a strong role for planning and regulation. Regulations are there for good reasons. And when people talk about red tape, it's often in a dismissive way but in relation to buildings i think we should all really think hard about what we're getting rid of if we're talking about getting rid of regulation and avoiding planning M many thanks thank Ab absolutely right uh, it, it it cannot be that permitted development rights are the way to achieve the quality and standard that, that we're going to need in the future by definition so, almost and almost by definition yeah, and it's a real concern because we need to think about how we're retrofitting the housing that we've got and and to be honest about what we've learned in the covid crisis so far it's not over but we have all learned what it is like for people's health their mental and physical health if they don't have access to open space if they don't have access to green space if they don't have access to fresh air if their home is poorly insulated and poorly ven ventilated that has consequences for their physical and mental health and we should have all learned that in the last four months and i think probably everyone in this call has and would say everyone deserves to have a home that they can afford to heat, afford to live in, and is going to keep them safe and well, mentally and physically. So we need to make sure that we redouble our efforts to defend that principle. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, now, I think, is it Tim Bell wanted to come in quickly on this one? Did, can you unmute yourself? Uh, no. No, if you that was too complicated. I, Jill, tell me who's next. Jamie, Jamie Ward and Keith Ritchie. Yeah, Jill, Jill I'll, I'll comment and comment now if that's all right. Um, just, Please. just picking up the uh, the comments that uh, you, Lord Best, have made and uh, Miss Debonair has just made about the Build Back announcement. Um, I'd like to to ask certainly the I'd like to have asked the Housing Minister, but in his absence, uh, Miss Thomas from MHCLG. Um, that uh, the uh, existing current building regs and future building regs and other government policies will apply to these build back plans. And we've highlighted particularly permitted developments. It, it seems inconceivable that a major house building conversion and retrofit program would not take them into account for all the reasons that have been uh, highlighted so far, the dangers of having another complete raft of poor quality housing put in place. We must have these standards applied at this stage. It's far more important than just building for quantity. And, and I'd like to hear some commitment from MHCLG that that will happen, please. Go on, Jenny, commit your <laughs> colleagues to... <laughs> I, I wish I could, but I think it's probably not my place to do that. But I, I've certainly been noting the points and we'll take them back. I think that's one that I would, rather than me say something now, which would not be a, a strong commitment that you would necessarily want, I would rather go back to colleagues internally and be able to get that response for you and return it to you if, that, if that's okay. Thank you. Thanks. Now, did Tom Bell want to come in next? I think I did ask you before. No. So, Jill, I'm not. I'm struggling here to to know yes. the order of your of speakers. Uh, bring Jamie Jamie Ward. Jamie Ward. Jamie, please. Um, and Emily. Can I mute? Emily, you're on duty. Yeah, Jamie should be able to talk now. I think. Sorry, yeah, I, was, I, did, I was doing a Lord Best there and speaking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> it was a question directed to the housing minister. So if it could be taken back, uh, I'd appreciate that. And it was a question if he will commit to ensuring that healthy homes and buildings are considered within building regulations and wider government policy. 
Absolutely. The power of building regulations. Let's never get away with from that. Uh, that's, uh, that is how we make things happen, having regulations. Uh, otherwise, voluntary codes and good practice guidance, it ain't enough. So, onward. Um, Jill, give me my next... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if Sangam has got to uh, go uh, shortly, um, maybe we should hear a bit more from her. Please, um, that would be great. Then, um, if we could bring in, um, we've got Lord uh, Chris and we've got Jeremy and... Uh, Our next panel group. We'll move on to them then in, in a second, but we're just if we may just hear from Thangam before she has to leave us final thoughts on, on healthy homes Thangam. well that is very kind of you to bring me in um it's yeah I've been shadow housing secretary now for 106 days I think and in that time because it happened during a lockdown and a health crisis I've had a lot of time to think about virtually nothing else other than how do how does home how does how do homes and health go together and I think as we come out of this crisis, and we're so far from out of it yet, uh, we may be out of parts of the lockdown, but we're not out of the COVID crisis. We, it ought to give us real fervour about, I have to say, housing regulations. It ought to give us real passion for them. Um, and I hope that it does for all of us, whatever party we are part of or not part of. Um, because... I don't think we would have designed, if we had to design a housing system for how to get through a pandemic and a lockdown, you wouldn't design the one we've got. You wouldn't design one where I can look at two blocks of flats next door to each other in my constituency, both council blocks, both well designed by the way, but one block, everybody has access to outdoor space and the next door block, nobody does. And the difference in both physical and mental health for those people before we even come on to whether or not they've been able to afford to pay for their heating bills if they've lost their jobs um, is immense. So I feel that COVID is not something we should ever have gone through. It's awful. And if it's to make any sense to us in years to come, it ought to be a moment when we, we decide that we're going to take what we've learned with us because we're going through a process. We're not going to be the same when we come out the other end. And when we come out the other side, we ought to have learned and we ought to be able to stand here or sit here as we are today and say, this, this was a time with this group of people, I really committed to the fact that I don't think anybody should live in a home that they can't afford to heat. And I don't think we should be wasting time trying to work out new commissions and new reviews when there are so many people who are so expert already on how to retrofit housing, how to insulate housing, how to install the sorts of fuel and heating systems that are going to sustain us and help us to meet our net zero carbon emissions and keep us healthy. That we can't pretend that we have all enjoyed working from home. For some people, it's been a boon. It's been a way that they could spend less time commuting. And for others, it's been terrible. It's been isolating and a cause of much unhappiness. For some people, it's been a time to take exercise on that they never did before. And for others, it's been impossible because they haven't had that access to the open space that some of us are able to take for granted. So I want us to take that with us as we go through what someone, I think it was, um, an article I read in the Financial Times about two months ago about how COVID is a portal and we're all going through it whether we like it or not. And what matters is what are we taking with us? What lessons are we taking with us? Um, what we're we leaving behind? And I think that if you ask everyone on this call, absolutely everyone, and I include the minister, who I know to be a good man, I've, I've known Chris for a long time. I think if you asked everyone on this call, should everybody have the right to a safe, secure home that is truly affordable, affordable to heat, powered by renewable energy, contributing to bringing down our carbon emissions to net zero, we'd probably all agree. So I want us to try and hang on to the fact that that takes political willpower and political willpower is something that we as elected representatives, we, are, we have to take risks with, but we also need the pushing from people who we deign to, we dare, sorry, not deign, we dare to represent. We should not be given the honour of representing you if we are not representing you on one of the most basic things there is, which is, are our homes making us sick or well? 
And I know that might sound polemical and that's, you know, that's also an opposition privilege because if I was the government minister or, or, or generally, I'd have to answer some really technical questions about things I've actually done. And I, I get the, you know, it's the opposite for opposition. We have to scrutinise, we have to challenge and we also get to paint pictures. But I think that's a picture which probably all of us would want to be part of. And I want us to hang on to that because it doesn't need to be party political, the desire to make sure that everybody's home is healthy. Great. Everyone in this chat has got so much detailed knowledge, way more than we've got time to pick through. But I'm only wish that I could spend more time with you today. And I'm hoping that we can maybe spend a bit longer when perhaps Chris is able to be with us and we can pick through this together and see how much common ground we've got where we could actually help support the government with doing a lot of what we're talking about. Terrific. Thank him. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed. And you Thank must you. take a bit of comfort from the two the two I billion. Do. That, that we have got so far so we're on the we're, we're, we're on a road it's yeah. not nothing it's definitely it's not, nothing. not nothing it's not nothing and that's it you know you, when you scrutinize government you also have to take the opportunity to say this bit here is good but i want the other seven you know so we, we've got the two but we want the nine that was committed to in the manifesto anyway i appreciate it and it's nice thank to be with you all thank you very much and have a good rest thanks of the meeting very much for joining us thank you for great now there are a few questions backing up but um, i think we must move on to our next panel and please save your questions and, until we've just heard from uh, the, 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 our other colleagues who are here uh, nigel crisp my colleague on the independent benches the cross benches in the house of lords lord crisp uh, and I know Nigel's recent book has been very well acclaimed. Health is made at home, hospitals for repairs. It, it's great stuff, Nigel. We're very glad to have you with us. Uh, Rachel Casey from the JRF, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. What a, what a good place to come from. <laughs> and Jeremy Porteous, uh, Jeremy from the Housing Learning and Information Network, the Housing Lynn, that does so much in this, in this interface between health and housing, really key player. Jeremy, glad to have you. Uh, would would each of the three of you just like to say a few words uh, before I go back to looking at the questions from the floor? Nigel, can I start with you? Thank, thank you very much indeed, uh, Richard. And can I apologize for the fact that the video has disappeared? Um, I'm assuming you can't see it. I can't see myself here. My only excuse is my two-year-old grandson was making a den under my desk yesterday and I haven't actually uh... tried it since then. So I'm gonna blame him. Um, let me start with a personal reflection. Um, as you kindly said, Richard, I've just done this book, Health is Made at Home, Hospitals are for Repairs, and it's all about the people outside the formal health system who are creating health. Um, and it's employers, it's teachers, it's schools, it's architects, it's families, it's communities, all the people who are creating health in our, in our communities. And I've been very struck by talking with people within the housing world um, both how much damage housing can do, and I talked to, had the privilege of talking to Jeremy, for example, uh, in this and taking his advice, how much damage could be done, but also how much can be done to create health, to create the conditions in which people can be healthy and help them to be so. Um, and I've been very impressed by seeing, visiting people and seeing what some of the housing associations are doing, and it sounds like Wakefield are doing some very interesting things. And I've also been very depressed by some of the things I've seen. Um, and it's for that reason that I have become a advocate for the Town and Country Planning Association Healthy Homes Act, with a view to perhaps bringing that in as a uh, private member's bill um, in the forthcoming Parliament. Because I believe we do need fundamental legislative change for the reasons that people have been talking about, because of the scale of the problem. We actually need a complete change in direction and a new vision, really, here. Uh, and reg regulation has disappeared in so many areas, but it's not just that. We currently regulate quality in the built environment in a fragmented way between housing, planning, and other regulatory regimes. Um, and as a result of that, Stephen Holgate, for example, pointed out that um, you know, we're ending up building or allowing housing to develop in warehouses and on uh, industrial estates and things like that. So the bill is actually arguing that we need legally enforceable minimum standards on some of the aspects of building design and placemaking, which go beyond the scope of existing building regulations. And we know that things like access to green space, which the uh, shadow minister was talking about, walkable neighborhoods, private amenity space are crucial to well-being. And the sector, I think, also needs the certainty and the clarity which legally enforceable minimum standards will bring. So essentially, the Healthy Homes Act 
will be arguing that essentially it makes the purpose of the planning and housing system to be about promoting well-being and health. It defines what a healthy ho home or place is via a series of high-level healthy home principles. Uh, the Act ensured that policy or developments which do not support these basic, and they are really quite basic standards, are essentially outlawed. Uh, and it introduces a Healthy Homes Commissioner to hold the government to account on implementing the Healthy Homes principles and promoting the best practice. Now, it seems to me this is only common sense, and I think the public would be surprised at some of the things that are allowed to happen, uh, rather again, as the, Deputy, as the Shadow Minister just said. Let me again just end, Richard, on, on a, another personal note. Um, my background's health. I've always been aware that housing is important to health and I've been aware of Octavia Hill uh, and so on and people like Jeremy in the Department of Health uh, when we were both there uh, were, were very influential. Um, but I didn't really get it, I think, until I actually went round and looked at things. And I think there's a good interface in health between the public health people and the, uh, uh, and the housing people. Um, I think we need to, I think there are probably quite a lot of people in health who are in the position I was and particularly the operational managers. And it's really important that we try and build some common culture, I think, between the operational managers in health um, uh, and the housing uh, development overall. Uh, I'm very happy to help do my part to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Nigel. Can I go straight on to Rachel, Rachel Casey from the JRF? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me on the panel. Um, so, yeah, I just some reflections on what everyone's been speaking about today, which has been extremely interesting. Um, and I think just some personal reflection as well. Like I think we've all know what it's like to be locked down in our homes during the pandemic. And I think our experience of home um, and how it interacts with our health um, and its importance has changed over that time. Um, but also recognising, um, as it's been brought up earlier in, in the sessions today, the experiences have not been the same for everyone and, and, and the virus has disproportionately impacted people living in poverty. Um, and I think it was early this year, actually, the Marmot Review found that poverty is the main driver of our worsening health. And as Rachel, I think Rachel Thomas mentioned earlier as well, life expectancy is in lower and more deprived areas. Um, and our analysis shows that um, I think it's just over six in 10 adults um, uh, are ex uh, in poverty report good or very good health in general. Um, and also in terms of housing, I think, as Professor Holgate said earlier, which really was striking and it kind of relates to some conversations I had with people on the ground at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, in terms of housing, I think it's been made more visible by uh, people experiencing very real difficulties in cramped and overcrowded uh, conditions. Um, and I know from speaking to grassroots organisations working with people living in temporary accommodation and people living in temporary accommodation and overcrowded homes themselves, it's meant the risk of contracting the virus has been significantly higher because you're having to use a shared kitchen or bathroom or you're crammed into one room and you have no inside or outside space for your children to play or for you to self-isolate. And I think this has been especially worrying for families still having to go out to work as well at this time and whether that's cleaning or working on public transport and supermarkets. And as Professor Holgate said earlier and has the Public Health England report into why the Black, Asian, minority and ethnic community were more affected by coronavirus um, cramped and poor housing conditions exacerbated by the pandemic uh, were exacerbated by the pandemic in these communities so and I would reiterate like I think we need not just quantity but it's quality when it comes to new homes that are fit for purpose and designed with the future in mind um, and um, and that's highlighted to me really I think how urgent um, is that we need more decent, affordable and social housing for our future health and well-being and security. Um, and I think just bringing up the government's drive to build back better, greener and faster, I think it's right to recognise the need to build many more homes, of course. However, that can't come at the expense of decent and affordable housing that communities want and actually desperately in need of. And I think there's a real risk in the government's pledge or government manifesto to build more beautiful homes that communities with by, by popular consent will be undermined by its announcement to further extend permitted development rights. Um, and I think I personally and I think across the sector we're worried that this will lead to more poor quality homes and the potential for future losses of affordable housing and I think the LGA I think did release some figures around I think it was about 13 and a half thousand affordable homes had been lost through um, the PDR scheme because homes have been developed outside of the um, normal planning framework 
um, and also a lot of these homes as we've talked about before have been used to house people um, a majority are office to residential conversions outside of local areas and away from support networks and communities and that is down to the due to lack of a social housing or the right type of social housing in that area or the, the size of the housing and also high cost of private renting which local housing allowance doesn't cover um, and families with low incomes and very low incomes depend on more than others on the community and on networks on friends local charities children's school to survive day to day and 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 obviously we've all the community has been integral and in supporting each other emotionally and practically throughout this crisis so i think just to make a couple of points i think scrapping planning laws without something strong to replace them without proper safeguards without beefing up building regulations without really making them fit for purpose um is going to really um give us a potential for a further weight of substandard cramped flats lacking the means of the green space and i don't think planning is a barrier to building new homes and the let women review showed us that actually um it's more to do with what's being built in terms of absorption rate and i also think obviously the the affordable housing commission reported today and had a 12 point plan and recommendations which i thought were extremely interesting around councils taking back control over permitted development rights and and also a housing conversion fund as well in terms of what we can do with empty homes which would be more healthy than um, uh, building them outside of the planning framework and also just the last point I think just to, to be mindful of um, for tenants in particular private and social the fitness for human habitation bill in 2018 required homes to be fit for human habitation at the start of the tenancy and to remain so throughout and, I, and I'm not sure and crucially that bill itself um, was to give um, tenants the right to take their landlord to court over unfit and unsafe conditions like uh, like these in their homes. So, um, and I'm not sure about the effectiveness of this there in terms of its implementation. Um, and I think it the onus is, was still remained on the tenant to take their landlord to court. And I think when you're looking at families or households on low incomes and their their ability to access legal recourse is extremely difficult at the minute especially legal aid um and so it comes down to um the fact that as we've said before you can have regulation and legislation it's how you implement it how do you resource it how can we ensure these building regulations are enforced uh, are enforced um how can we ensure that homes are built um, lifetime homes are built from from scratch you know how can we make sure that those things are enforceable rather than just a consideration um, and I think we can do do much more and we can do much more better in rebuilding and redesigning the housing system and as Thangam said before and has we've all been saying there are we we're all in the room we have all these ideas we know what to do um, and I think that's really important to ensure that families and children um, go on in the future have access to affordable and decent homes which will unlock families from poverty and free them to enjoy opportunities we all want. Um, so those are my thoughts just on what everyone said for today. Brilliant. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. i just pick a couple out quickly. The Affordable Housing Commission's latest report, I chair this thing, uh, it came out this afternoon. So do if you go to the website, Affordable Housing Commission, uh, that has our 12 recommendations for how we, uh, post-COVID, uh, really invest, take the opportunities that now exist of lower prices, of builders getting out, of landlords selling up, now's the time to build up the social sector it's, it's the perfect moment but you also admonish us parliamentarians i took the uh, homes fitness for human habitation bill through the house of lords and uh, the, you quite rightly make the point rachel that us parliamentarians we think we've done a great job uh, we get a bill through, but it's got to be implemented things have got to happen on the ground and that part two uh, may be more difficult than getting the legislation through in the first place important as that is but many thanks to you finally in our trio jeremy uh, over to you jeremy porteous uh, thank you lord best and uh, i'm sorry i'm slightly late joining uh, this afternoon i know the title of the session is about bridging uh, the health and housing gap i'm sure for some it feels more like a canyon at times um, and so what i'm really going to try and pick up on is some of the things um, nigel just mentioned about how do we still form a, a better common culture and, and what's that interface between health and housing and for me there's sort of four critical things which relate to what I call the, the four L's 
Uh, one is how we better capture the lived experience of people around their housing circumstances, particularly those uh, with a long-term condition, uh, those who are experiencing uh, poor health. And we know, and I'm sure Rachel and others talked about uh, the link between uh, poor housing and health inequalities. Uh, the second is about how we get a better language around a shared language. Um, I'm aware over the last 10 years there have been more pilots in the Department of Health and Sarah talked about the integrated care systems. Uh, there have been about eight or nine different whole system demonstrator vanguards uh, and the joke within the Department of Health when I was there, there were more pilots than British Airways. Well, with COVID going on, that, that may be the case. Um, but uh, the third, real two critical things, but how do we ensure there's more effective system leadership? Um, and one of the things maybe is, well, you know, we have an NHS five-year forward view. How does that parallel with a, a housing forward view? And how do we dovetail that strategically so that we have a structural change of that culture as well? And thirdly, or fourthly, is how do we pick up the learning from all that and I probably would say that somebody who oversees a, a learning network but at the heart of this I think is we can make a real good case for the significant system and personal outcomes that, that housing makes to the health system and some work that the housing Lynn was involved with with the local government association showed both the health efficiency in terms of reducing demand uh, for, for more uh, acute uh, services, but also delaying or diverting some of that demand by providing better care and support in the home. Uh, and that actually unlocked health dividends in terms of care and system efficiencies, as I said, but also improved the outcomes of individuals in terms of their experience around both using the systems, but also their, their housing circumstances, in particular around giving them greater choice and control around their housing but also the improved quality of life um, and better health outcomes in terms of uh, managing uh, their uh, particular health conditions and self-care where appropriate. So I think in terms of taking some of this forward, um, I think you know we need to think about this in both in terms of how we generate our communities and uh, we heard from Jenny about the Home of 2030 program and other initiatives. That, that we had the judging panel last week and some real things are starting to, to bind through. But the three things I probably just want to, to leave with you are one is around future design and how we design our homes and spaces for health. Uh, building on the care ready principles of happy. Uh, last week the designing building for a healthy life 12 was uh, 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 implemented. Um, we also need to think about the accessibility about the work that the Home Coalition of others have done in relation to both lifetime homes but also thinking about RM of the regulations and I don't know if anybody mentioned issues around things like DFGs and the way that those are operated through the Better Care Fund where there's a really good uh, mechanism for joint working to better allocate resources to support people in the way we adapt our homes and perhaps we should be thinking about how we adapt them for technology as well and not just for the physical space uh, because it seems to me that that will be very much part of a, a digital inclusion uh, as well in the future so those are just some initial comments from me. Jeremy, many, many thanks for those uh, comments too. Um, so, uh, people who haven't yet made a point, but, but uh, who've notified us that they wish to do so, I'm asking Jill to, to officiate here and tell me who I should call on next. I think if you could bring in uh, Daniel uh, Slade from the TCPA, who's on the, on the screen there, so if you can unmute him uh, and I think also um, perhaps uh, Sean Deans uh, would also like to ask I know he's got a pre-submitted question so I would start with those two right um, and also we have some interesting from Rico um, he's been quite active on the um, chat so he might be a good person to to bring in so let's right. let's do that order let's do that Daniel from TCPA, you you are called upon next, and I and I I did see in the chat that the that uh, Jade Lewis from the Sustainable Energy uh, Association says why hasn't the TCPA included the indoor environment in its uh, healthy homes bill that Nigel is promoting? So you might just pick up on that one too, Daniel. Now you need to unmute. That's the way. Uh, look. Hi, Daniel. Can you, you there? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, excellent. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, well, my first, my, the first thing I'd like to say is uh, in the latest version of our Healthy Homes Bill, no um, we do. Um, you do take into account 
the, um, the, the indoor, indoor air quality and um, the indoor environment in general. I think the only point I really wanted to, to, to make in response to a lot of this conversation is we shouldn't lose sight of the importance that place has in um, the, the, the health, uh, in producing healthy homes. Um, by this I mean you can't, you, you could, you can't have a perfectly well-designed healthy home which is in the wrong place. That, that it completely is a paradox, it simply doesn't work. Um, one of the things I think we're trying to do with the Healthy Homes is to, is to make sure there are minimum standards for things which go beyond the fabric of the home itself. Um, we know that things like access to green space are fundamentally important to people's well-being. Um, so what we try to do is create minimum standards around uh, access to things like walkable neighbourhoods and, and green infrastructure and ensure that every single new home which has been built um, has, has access to those, those kinds of services. So uh, I think there's, some, there's something to be looked at around the interface between um, building regs and planning and just trying to um, ensure that, that that is joined up more effectively. So much of the conversation we have, and I think maybe which has happened so far in this, in this it talks about those two regimes in isolation. We're facing separate issues and with separate solutions. I think the thing I'll um, just finish on and just one sort of reflection on the conversation so far is that it's really, really important. We don't lose sight of the fact that once upon a time, we were building things to much higher standards. Uh, the, the Parker Morris standards existed for, for decades and vastly increased the quality of, of council houses for a long time. A lot of the um, houses built during that period, up until around the 1980s, are still some of the best quality housing we have in the country. It was perfectly possible, it was revolutionary, and it's easy enough, I think, it's perfectly within our ability to return to building things to those standards using um, similar ambitions. Great, a really, a really good point. Go back a hundred years, and we did better then. Sean Deans. Yes, uh, I'm just going to come in with a very kind of quick question that I'd like to pose to any of the panelists, really, to to answer. Um, and the question is, how can we ensure a holistic approach is taken in uh, to future housing policy, both in terms of new build and retrofit, to deliver health and well-being for the occupants? Uh, of, of housing and also to provide long-term benefit to the NHS. Provoked any response? Nigel, Jeremy, Rachel? Well, if, if, I, may, if I may just make, make a point, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously a very important point and it links, I think, quite closely with, with Dan, Daniel Slade's um, point about place um, and about the linking of policies together. Um, uh, and indeed the points that, that Jeremy was making, it seems to me, about, um, uh, about where the health service is coming from. One of the things that struck me is, is as I said at the beginning, I, I've spent a lot of time over the last year talking to people outside health about how, what they're doing, but actually whether they describe it as this or not, is improving health and well-being and is, is creating health. And that's just, that, that, in a way, some of that's got more joined up during COVID. There's been a lot more local action of uh, of people working together uh, much more closely. Um, but I think we need a sort of movement uh, and a sort of, I didn't mean a movement in a sort of totally organized way, but a, a sort of understanding that these things link together and we need to get more people to understand um, the, the way in which they link together, which is why it's so important that you have something like this APPG, which is trying to um, uh, pull out those stories and, the, uh, 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 and make those points. Um, yeah. But it's in the mindset as well as in the policies, it seems to me. Yeah. Rain Can I just, uh, yeah, so, sorry. Um, I'm just sort of drawing on from my experience because I've just recently been deployed to our housing trust um, during the pandemic, working with care care teams with all their um, care homes and um, something from my own experience working in social care uh, for about a decade. Um, how important it is um, around like we talked about cross government committees around multidisciplinary multi organizational approaches and there's something that I learned um, from speaking to our heads of care services is that we talk about like in, in dementia care for example we talk about keeping people at home independently as long as possible and that's really important in terms of housing yet yeah, and housing in policy and debates we rarely talk about health and care and, and and keeping people at home and um 
well from my perspective anyway um and i think uh, that's something that maybe making aware in terms of like supported housing for example having um more awareness of the role of housing in these particular care pathways is really crucial um a crucial um thing to do and i think we saw from wakefield district housing um how those sort of within those services there are housing uh, points of contact or housing officials within health and and this is all about creating um, a pathways for people but also about uh, creating homes that people want to live in um not everyone would like to live in a retirement village for example um not everyone not everyone wants to leave their home people want to stay in the home as long as possible yet the home can't be adapted um so I think it's maybe looking at how what we build and like we've just heard there from um, Daniel, I think um, it's about where they are as well. Um, but I just wanted to bring that little insight in. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jeremy. Yeah, on, the, on the retrofitting thing, I think there are two aspects. One's the individual. So I think there's issues around how we can help adapt, replace, repair, improve existing stock uh, so that there's a better life experience of using, using those homes, uh, especially for an aging population or those with disability. Um, and at a, at a spatial level, which is also touched on in terms of our healthy neighbourhood, obviously some of the good work that's come out of the Healthy New Towns programme has a really good interface with, with public health. But I don't know if you know, but today the Welsh Government have uh, announced their uh, planning framework. Um, which includes a section on accessible and healthy neighbourhoods. Uh, and again, there's some really good lessons we could learn from some of the strategic direction uh, that's been taken in other parts of the UK as well. We did have that report, you remember, Lifetime Homes, comma, Lifetime Neighbourhoods. Neighbourhoods. Mm. Setting the context of place uh, yeah. for those Lifetime Homes. Uh, absolutely. Rico, did you want to come in? Uh, yes, I think um, it's been a really interesting conversation. Um, we represent typically small, smaller builders and contractors, um, but especially on those last three points, especially ones that Rachel just made, I actually worked in residential care for a few years and I ended up in this job after working in the public sector for quite some time. Um, I think she's absolutely correct. You know, so if you look at like the housing needs assessment, it doesn't identify whether we need semi-residential care, full residential care, or even independent living. Um, I went on a little charge to get more bungalows made and there was a lot of pushback from local authorities. We looked at something like um, building in backyards so that local people can stay local and still retain their support, support networks. You know, you've given a good framework here for all these conversations to be kind of driven. And, you know, we talk about retrofit. Um, we we're looking at whether we should have a stamp duty retrofit when the holiday is over, uh, which will give us enough time to really understand who can actually do the job of retrofit in the country, because we don't quite know yet who's got the skills and we haven't got the skilled workforce to deliver that, um, you know, with the healthy home standards. You know, SMEs especially have been putting in air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps for a few years now, but we don't hear about those technologies and we've had many changes, for example, um, on SUDS, sustainable urban training systems. Now they can actually include ground source heat pumps, um, but we don't talk necessarily how can we can link all these things that we want to achieve with the things that are already occurring? So I think this is this group has given us a really good opportunity to crystallise what exactly is going on at the moment and what isn't, um, and, and how we deliver that. And right at the very start, I thought you made a, a really interesting piece um, talking about racial inequality. Um, I read an article about London two weeks ago um, identifying why if the government wants to solve some racial equality issues in housing in London, it needs to invest in social housing because actually 60% of the black population live in London, 40% of the Asian population live in London. Now, what that means to me is that London has a, is a specific case and separating its challenges from the rest of the UK is going to be absolutely vital. And I know that people, there will be pushback when people say we invest in London too often. <laughs> but when there's a very clear, obvious concern, it's worth having those conversations and whether that, and that allows us to then say, hey, we need more independent living opportunities in our more rural communities. So we actually understand what is a neighbourhood. And lastly, because I know I've gone on a bit and I can do that, um, I really bemoan the loss of spatial planning because if we just consider transport, now developers are told where to build uh, and how to build to fit, fit in the transport network. So they could be providing an empty bus that runs for two years and is used by five people a month. Now, if we knew what route, what transport routes are part of what um, access point, maybe in a spatial planning approach, we could deliver better communities. So this is about so many different things, including yes. the SME builders who 
train and retain seven out of ten apprentices um, and that they are the local employers this is such a wide conversation and I think it's brilliant that you've come together to understand what we can do great thanks for that Rico R right now any anyone with a last uh, point before I just uh, pull one or two thoughts together at the end um, Jill guide me to anyone who who's notified you you're muted now <laughs> Um, that's Colin Tim Timmins uh, next, um, and if we can quickly from Neil Freshwater, Velux, and Francis Newell, the three questions that have their oh hands. Oh my goodness! I don't know if you can just do quick statements. Or... Quick statements, Colin, you go okay. first. Colin, yeah, Tim. Very, very quickly. Um, it was just a very simple example, really, of of how to join things up. We've got um, the Green Homes Grant Scheme coming in. Mm. Uh, with about two billion pounds being spent on homes yeah. uh, largely we expect to to improve the insulation so alongside that I, I think we need to make sure that you know the full extent of the building regs is, is put in place so that we consider the ventilation at the same time um, because you insulate you're also increasing the air tightness if we make sure that there's ventilation put in at the same time and we also make sure that it's part of the grant scheme um, then we can also make sure that the air quality isn't compromised and, and, and in fact could be made better. It's just a simple example of something that, that we could do. Very quickly. Sure. Definitely. Neil? Hi there, yes, it was just a, a quick comment really, a takeaway for Jenny at MHCLG, just around um, the sort of requirements for daylight. I, I'm from Villach, so I declare an obvious commercial interest in, in that. But obviously in Scotland, we have a, where, where we're based, we have a, a requirement in the building Re regulation for um, access to natural light. This is not something I don't think exists in England. Um, I was reminded of it as we talked about the, uh, the draft Healthy Homes Act, because I believe that's something that's in it, but also particularly with this focus on the, uh, the building programme with the permitted development and particularly around uh, the permitted rights for converting commercial. I just think it's something which I think would be good to, good to consider so that there is a a requirement for um, access to natural light. So that's my comment. Thank you. It's, it's, what could be more important than light? Yeah, are those permitted development uh, schemes where there are no windows. You just you cannot credit that people are being asked to live in a place with no windows. Um, last point. I think it's Francis Newell. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Francis, we can. Great. Um, hi, everybody. I work for NHS England and Improvement, and I just want to finish by encouraging colleagues who work in housing to make connections to their NHS colleagues to bridge that gap that a couple of people have talked about between health and housing. So I would encourage them to reach out at integrated care system level or on the local authority footprint or indeed at neighbourhood level and make the connection between housing, development and provision and connect into those population health initiatives. Because you've seen that work, we've seen that working very well in Wakefield, it's worked well across Gloucestershire, Greater Manchester, and we'd really like to see that replicated across all health and care partnerships. That's such a good point. It's ordinary people, so to speak, talking to each other, understanding each other's language in health and in housing, getting together just one to one to start with, just to talk things through and, and see where those synergies lie. I've, I have felt for ages that we do things too far up the scale. It's the health and well-being board that's supposed to mastermind these liaisons and uh, partnerships. It, that's not for real. It's down on the ground where people are doing, trying to do a good job in their separate silos of housing and health. If they just talk to each other and get together, that's such a big lesson. Thank you very much, Francis. Well, that does bring us to the end of our time. I mean, there are one or two, I thought, uh, ways in which things can be progressed so we don't stop here uh, the stuff on the horizon that that will make a difference in the future uh, harnessing those opportunities is going to be is going to be uh, I, I, I think a task ahead we've got the future homes consultation uh, jenny was telling us about this uh, this is a chance to, to bring together the things that need to be in regulations uh, I, I think we we want to maximize when we see what government responds I think, Jenny, you said uh, in the near future or, or fairly soon, <laughs> um, those government words, but uh, sooner the better we get something to get our teeth into uh, and, and react to for government. That's going to be an opportunity. 
the, the Sustainable Energy Association has got its, uh, its domestic premises energy performance bill that is uh, trying to get all homes up to uh, energy performance certificate uh, band C by 2035. It's 15 years away, but and C isn't, isn't that brilliant, but making steps toward that, making it a legal requirement that one moves toward that, that's where the SEA is coming from. And then there's the TCPA's Healthy Homes Bill that Nigel was talking about, legally enforceable minimum standards. Um, as, 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 as we heard from Daniel, getting back to the kind of standards that Parker Morris and in the past we've got used to, space standards, but including um, the place aspects, the access to green space, as well as the, the internal things like uh, uh, air quality, light and ventilation issues. So there are, there are around us opportunities, I think, to get engaged with, because this is an all-party parliamentary group, to get engaged with things to do with parliament, with legislation, with changing, changing the world through uh, parliamentary action. So thank you all very much for joining this uh, APPG session. Special thanks, if I may say so, to uh, Professor uh, Stephen Holgate. Um, delighted to have you with your expertise uh, in our midst. Many thanks for joining us. And thanks for all those other panelists for coming and, and thank you for joining in. And indeed, thanks to Jill Morris and Emily Carter who, who looked after us uh, throughout. So uh, many thanks to everybody. Thanks yeah. for coming. Thank you.